take for instance, look at the triage area. The triage area for the initial assessment and to the first follow-up was at 0%. And with the second follow-up, the third follow-up, it went up to 60%. And with the fourth follow-up, it went the fifth. And we can see that it is progressing up to 100%. And we can see the trend with the other ones for mask use, availability of screening tools, and the case definitions. We look at implementations. Continuous education on the following. A triage at the entrance of the facilities, mask use, environmental cleaning. Then, the supplies from the Resolve to Save Lives project has brought about improvement in triage areas, especially with the reception of the canopies, an increase in mask use, and improvement in environmental cleaning. In most of the facilities also, there has been the institution of cleaning registers and the use of the two bucket system for cleaning, which has really greatly improved the environmental cleaning. Here on this slide, you'll find some pictures just to show us the improvements we have had in the different facilities. On the first picture you see, you can see before triage was done in the open and you can see the improvement after the, the, tent is, the, the tents were received, they are being set up for improved triaging. Then we can also see a picture where bar soap is being replaced with liquid soap as the, the, the first facility immediately receives liquid soap and that replacement is done. We also have reception of infrared thermometer that is a screening tool. And we also see mass compliance here with reception of supplies. Some of the challenges face, we have long distances on motorbikes with the risk of falls and back aches. And then long waiting time at bus stops for internet connectivity, accessibility to the site. And you can see some pictures on the side there showing you the difficult roads we had to go through to be able to get to these facilities. And you can see how challenging, you can see how difficult uh, the roads are to so get into the site. Lessons learned. Continuous training and supervision will lead to understanding and compliance and the availability of supplies on time and always having the supplies will need to proper use. We can see a picture there of meetings with chiefs of centers and supervisors on nursing services to explain the result to save life project and emphasizing the importance of screening and record keeping. The recommendations, we, we, have, we could having the necessary supplies, providing the necessary supplies, the necessary supplies readily available at the facilities will continuously help them to, to use, to, 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 it will lead to mass, I mean, it will lead to compliance. Continuous on the job training for facility staff on hand hygiene and mask use. And then continuous supervision on IPC and wash. Thanks for your kind attention, over. Uh, thank you, Faith, for getting to share that detailed uh, country perspective. Next uh, online is uh, Dr. Kudisa Mohammed, who is a medical epidemiologist from the Addis Ababa Health uh, Bureau in uh, Ethiopia. He is going to share with us the country uh, perspective from Ethiopia. Over to you, Dr. Kudisa. Okay, thank you, Lizzie, and this, and I thank your panelists. So, screen, please. Lizzie, allow me to share the screen. Thank you, uh, Faith. You may stop sharing the screen. So, can you hear me, Lizzie? Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Gudiza. Please go thank ahead. You. Okay. So I am Gudisa Mohammed from Ethiopia. 
uh, Addis Ababa. Uh, today I'm sharing uh, my experiences uh, with you. So I'm a medical doctor and IPC expert from Ethiopia, particularly from uh, the, the city. And I would like to say thank you for those who gave me the chance to share or uh, to have this stage with you. So I'm one of the facility monitor uh, who is working with Eigen Resolve project on IPC. And then today I'm glad actually to share my experience uh, that I get while I was following the facilities. And then here I'm not to, te to teach you actually, uh, just to learn more from you all. Uh, so I'm happy uh, to see such learning platform from African family and with the aim of preventing and controlling the infection. So still, uh, I'm ha ha happy uh, uh, working IPC and uh, to aspire professional from the different disciplines uh, to work on IPC. So uh, by saying this, let me uh, proceed to my short and brief uh, presentation. So uh, my objective of this presentation includes overview of the project using M and the EP2, and then the result uh, from visits to facilities and also implementing and the improvements we get. And then the other, the lessons we learn and also challenges and achievement. And then uh, our suggestion, how to uh, sustain the infection prevention standards in the facilities. So this slide uh, shows us uh, that I can, with a, financial support from result started working in Ethiopia uh, starting from early in August. So uh, 52 facilities were selected across the country like with uh, different criteria. And then actually, as I've told you that I'm from Addis Ababa, and then I have five facilities, two monitors, and then these are all health centers. So the health centers selected with stated uh, criteria at the moment. The objective of uh, the supervision or the objective of the project that the world was like to increase the infection prevention uh, control practice of uh, the facilities and also increase the quality of healthcare service because as we know out of the six okay. dimensions out of six dimension of the quality uh, the patient safety is uh, one and uh, the major cornerstone and also along with the patient we need to maintain or preserve the safety of our healthcare workers so once we uh, practice or see the improvement within these uh, five facilities, our plan is to increase uh, and expand the practice to the rest of healthcare facilities. So we started the, the project and we, uh, as I've said, we selected the, the, the centers, health centers with proposed criteria. And then also from the uh, I can, we were also given the training how to monitor the facilities and also how to conduct online uh, registration of data and how to use those M and A uh, materials. So in, immediately after that, we put, we planned a six months plan was made and then uh, the schedule was how to uh, have a regular meeting with the health centers and how to have a regular meeting with the uh, monitor from the region and also from the headquarter. So this is one of our plans that as, as you see at the bottom, I have, I made plan of six months starting from September, October, which lasts to uh, January and then f f February. So as it was mentioned earlier, we uh, made six visits to the uh, health centers and the visits uh, took twice per month and then it is every two weeks. So this is uh, like some sort of the uh, check, the monitoring checklist. So it, it contains or the tool contains like more, it focuses on screening and triage area. And then the other area was uh, within the facility area. And then the other environmental cleaning and disinfection and the rest around the, the supplies with associated with the pharmacies. So these uh, screening tools, uh, these monitoring tools are actually easy to understand for everyone, and then easy to pick major gaps within the facilities. And also for us, for the monitors, and also for the uh, facility coordinators who are working at the, at the facility itself. It could be uh, IPC expert or anyone from the infection prevention committee. So this is the, 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 
screening tool, as I've mentioned, like early from the beginning, it speaks of, uh, about the triage, whether we have tent, whether they are healthcare workers, uh, which are assigned at the, at the, the pre-triage, whether they are documenting, whether they are really uh, the triaging patient is, uh, whether they are giving masks for those suspected cases. And also within the facilities, as you see, there are clear uh, indicators that, that we were uh, following. So by doing this uh, visit with this MNA uh, tool, we identified many gaps and many uh, uh, problems within, within the facilities, but like some of the, the problems or some of the gaps may be listed here. As you can see, there were uh, poor uh, in, in uh, I can say in all health, five health five centers, there were uh, no regular clients because as we know, infection prevention goes in an early tracing and source control. Early identification source control is our, the main tool for, to contain the infection, but uh, the, we were uh, not doing uh, the trash one. And then also there were uh, no hand washing practices, facilitating environment uh, for such practice, even at the, at the gate and the pre trash area. Also you can, uh, in, in the facilities, we, 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 I uh, saw that there were no updated case definition posted in such kept updating us in every week or every two, two, two months based on the, the, the uh, disease progression. So uh, there were no posted update posted in a triage area or clinical serving area. So the major issue, again, we identified was associated with waste management practices. Actually, this was a big problem across the country, across our facilities. And then we, we, we uh, saw this thing. The other is uh, as, as availability of medical equipment and the su su supplies. Because during this pandemic, we uh, ran out of medical equipment that actually goes with supplies as a like of PPEs and also some cleaning uh, solutions. And the other is uh, IP monitoring was uh, not uh, at the place and then in, in uh, the facilities. And then healthcare workers at some of the health centers were not trained on infection prevention, were not trained on COVID-19 uh, virus. And also, also poor mask utilization, both by healthcare workers and uh, the uh, clients. So our implementation um, goes, uh, I can categorize into three areas while we were monitoring these facilities. So the first thing was it, it, it goes to coaching, mentoring, and then an on-site training. While we are uh, following the facility, while we are monitoring the facilities, we were mentoring uh, the, the, the healthcare workers, the, the IPC focals, and also we, were, we are showing them how to uh, prepare materials, how to use Mask is the rational use of mask, and also we are uh, uh, showing them how to make some cleaning solutions, and also uh, then uh, the, the 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 other one goes to the data use. We uh, collect the data online and submit to uh, uh, HQ, and then also uh, we use uh, we have a hard copy with us so that we share with the managing. Uh, team of the, the health center, including the, the, the directors from the health facility so that they sit down and, and work on the gaps identified. And then the other uh, major work area or major implementation area is like goes to the, uh, the ICANN as directly supported on supplies, on equipment and also on trainings. And then like as of, uh, I, we may see later uh, with a picture. So in, uh, starting from the beginning, we established IPC committee and assigned focal persons and then uh, discussed to have regular meeting on a weekly basis. And then we, uh, the monitors will follow the facilities on two week base. And then we then the assessment by ourselves and the facilities uh, uh, by themselves. So IPC training were conducted for IPC focal, educate workers and including the, the cleaners. This is some sort of the examples we got, uh, the action plans uh, made by facilities. So based on these action plans, uh, we, we have got some uh, results. So the result goes immediately to the, to the triage area. So as I've mentioned earlier, there were a full triage system, but after we start to implement the project, uh, all health, health centers, the five health centers has dedicated screening area even including tent. And then there is active triage area. When you say active triage, there is active screening, active recording, and also 
actively uh, sorting the cases and also there's associated suspected uh, areas identified to keep suspected cases. So there are post, uh, posted update COVID-19 case definition, clear and visible signage with local and international language, and then active screening area and registration and reporting to local surveillance team. So here is one of the uh, picture I took from uh, one center. Uh, the Climate Hotel Center, pre triage area. As you can see here, the team is uh, like screening and also there is, I, I just sent to, the, to them, there's a lab team which can collect the sample for uh, those uh, suspected cases who can uh, meet the criteria to, 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 to be tested. And then this is uh, a picture to Yeka and the uh, Galan Health Center. So uh, healthcare workers are actively sitting on their bench, bench and the screening the clients, as you can see, with Amharic local language and also uh, with uh, English that we are posted and clearly signaged. So the other improvement we found was it goes to the hand hygiene availability. I can fully tell all health facilities has available hand washing at all health center at the gate at the emergency and also. Uh, outpatient treatment areas, water supplies with backup and liquid soap sanitizers are available actually on those five health centers. There are still gaps to the rest of the facilities. So you can see the pictures uh, from uh, one of the health center, Korea Zamach Health Center. So clients are actually using, uh, washing their hand before they get into the facility. So this is the same example uh, from different Health center. So the other uh, improvement is regarding the case definition. So starting when we started on September, the case definition, which posted on January 2020, was uh, available at, at, at the facilities. There were no updated case definitions. So uh, healthcare workers were not looking at it. So the case definition was ported even to the updated January. Uh, the updated January uh, case definition from WHO was posted earlier this week, la, la, last month, and then suspected suspected cases are being on a report to the surveillance team. Also isolation corners are prepared for suspected cases. So here you can see uh, the posted. And the other is availability of medical equipment and supplies. So with the help of uh, even ICANN with Resolve, and also we, we, we engaged the Regional Health Bureau and other uh, stakeholders, Joe's also, participated in, we participated and we, I facilitated in organizing those NGOs in distributing the medical equipment and the supplies as a like of waste bins, infrared thermometer, vital sign measuring like of BP cuff, oximetries were uh, availed. And then the other most important thing, the utilization of mask. And then uh, earlier there were uh, actually uh, in, 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 in uh, in distributed mask utilization was uh, uh, identified or witnessed. But nowadays, now here in the city, we don't serve any patient without mask, even let alone in the facilities outside uh, the healthcare facility in hotels and then in, 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 in people gathering there, there is no mask and no service uh, mm -hmm. slogan like, which we started implementing starting from last month. So the patients are not allowed to get into the health facilities without mask. And then we all suspected cases will be provided uh, mask at pre triage area. So uh, mask compliance actually decreasing over the whole country. But the utilization in, in those selected facilities are still going good. And then uh, the mass compliance by healthcare workers is one of our indicators while we are uh, monitoring the patient significantly increased during our regular facility visit. So even we encouraged the facility leaders to have or to buy masks with their own budget on a regular basis because we follow the, at least the minimum uh, to, 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 to manage this pandemic, the utilization of masks, the, the hand washing and the maintaining our distances. So uh, there are local uh, factories who can produce these masks and then with a good amount of money, facilities are encouraged to buy masks and distribute for healthcare workers at least and on and on every two, week, two weeks and distribute the mask on daily basis. So we also conducted training on how to, uh, for on proper uh, PPs or rational use of PP, even including the mask. This is one way of a resource if we don't properly or rationally use the, our uh, 
PPs, we, we run out of it at the end. So the other side uh, goes to healthcare waste management. So bleach preparation, actually, we, we, we gave uh, training for cleaners uh, at, at all health uh, centers and how to prepare the, the different uh, concentration of uh, bleach mm -hmm. so that they can use for different purpose. The other, how to uh, observe it and then we give feedback during our uh, supervision that there's such waste bins also are built and then uh, distributed. <laughs> so the others are sanitary equipment that uh, supplied like as a like of uh, water backups, rotos, hand free hand washing and PP try to do on waste disposal and tents are also distributed to the uh, all five health centers. So this is uh, the, the table which shows uh, the, the support or the supplies we, we get from uh, ICANN. So as you can see, all these personal protective equipment is distributed across the country based on the patient load and the based, based, based on the, 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 the disease progression in, in, in a defined area. So you can see these things are uh, provided by ICANN to uh, all health centers as an example, to Felagamala Health Center and Yeka Health Center. So uh, the follow-up continued every two weeks, we will have a regular follow-up. Every week we have discussion with all monitors across the country, with the monitors for, from the center. So we will also following with the color coded progress monitoring. And also we have a Telegram group to share our experiences on a daily basis. So you can see here from the color coded progress. So triage area, because you, you can see more red color here at, at the beginning of the follow up and it becomes yellowish and then at the end more green that is with uh, satisfactory and a good progress. So the lesson we, uh, we learned that even uh, I think uh, the resources were not such much. The resource we invested on, on this project is, 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 my, uh, is my suggestion. So, but I see uh, a lot of projects with a huge amount of money, but with little uh, outcome. So I don't think that the amount of resource really matters, but the way we invest, because here in this project, uh, we involve it, the facilities themselves so that they can engage, so that they can do it by themselves. And we only show them the result. So with their own resource and then the resource from other projects, the resource from our other NGOs, engage together and with for better outcome. So this is one of the lessons I learned. And the other is uh, the project was owned by the facility themselves. So rather than we are doing for by ourselves, it's good if they uh, continue by doing themselves. So we, we, we the, the, the monitoring and evaluation tool is so easy and we provide it for infection prevention committee, for infection prevention focal, so that they will continue monitoring by themselves and then the importance of regular follow-up because if we don't follow it regularly, uh, the, the, the challenge may come up later. And so, uh, and then the other, the challenge we uh, I faced during this uh, six months pro project were frequent staff turnover at the facilities. So once you settle the facility with one individual, then uh, the, it will be assigned to other area. This creates a little uh, chasm so the other is sustainability issue because as I've told you, this improvement came through regular monitoring and regular follow-up every two weeks. So yeah, I sometimes doubt if we can continue, but we, I, we were preparing for that. If, 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 if things go bad or if, if this support won't continue, the facility should maintain and the follow-up should maintain. The, the, the monitoring by itself. And then the other is infection prevention equipment supplies as my one of uh, the previous uh, presenter uh, explained. And then the other is leadership commitment to some of the health centers. The leaders are actually won't really engaged. So that creates a big challenge for us. So as a way forward, uh, we need to engage the, the different level of leadership starting from the ministry to the regional and also to, uh, to the lower level so that the facility level can engage and uh, the result will be better. So it's good if the facility IPC committees continue the checklist. And also uh, I, I would like to see that this project expand and also other facilities start to use this monitoring and thank you for having your time. Over to you.
Thank you, uh, Dr. Kudisa, uh, for that uh, country perspective. And now without uh, wasting so much time, I am going to uh, present uh, the overview of the project. On behalf of uh, Anna Von Ran, who is the project manager for ICANN. So this project was for the M&E for uh, primary healthcare settings, and it's in uh, collaboration with uh, Resolve to Save Lives. So uh, just as a brief uh, background, uh, ICANN is, uh, was formed 12 years ago, and uh, it has a membership from 54 countries, and uh, there is a coordinator for each region. The vision for ICANN is to have an African continent where safe patient care is assured for all through the implementation of strong evidence-based infection co uh, control programs. So currently ICANN has over 440 financial members from 34 African countries and 14 affiliate societies. And the activities which ICANN embarks on, mostly it's uh, education, program implementation, outbreak management, planting associations, that is uh, helping them uh, with guideline development, advocacy and uh, mentorship. Uh, ICANN also has, uh, plays an advocacy role for integrating IPC into healthcare settings. ICANN works with uh, quite a number of partners, partners, uh, the Resolve to Save Lives, uh, CDC, that is Africa CDC, and also the African Union. We have uh, the World Health Organization, Water Aid, ICAP, CSIR, National IPC Societies, and the Glasgow Caledonian University. And uh, ICANN has helped to establish uh, some uh, IPC societies in the different countries that are listed in that slide. For example, there's Infection Control Association of Zimbabwe, the Nigeria Society for Infection Control, the Infection Prevention and Control Association for Cameroon, the Infection Prevention Society for Liberia, and in Tanzania, the Wash and Infection Prevention National Society. And there's also work in progress to uh, um, develop uh, some more associations in Ethiopia, in DRC, and in Ghana. Under the Resolve to Save Lives project, uh, ICANN and Resolve to Save Lives embarked on a project to evaluate the IPC training and COVID-19 preparedness of the primary healthcare facilities across in May 2020, uh, developing of a easy but concise M&E tool that could be easily understood by everyone. And then they established a team in six different countries. And uh, this was uh, through user societies. And then the countries were then uh, had to sign in a memorandum of understanding with uh, ICANN. And uh, the countries under the covered by this project was Nigeria, Liberia, Cameroon, Ethiopia, DRC and Kenya, and uh, there's also a different role in Uganda. So in uh, Uganda, uh, the, the aim is to provide technical advice to the Ministry of Health, uh, IPC coordinator, and the IPC sub-pillar under the COVID response, and uh, that is a position that uh, I have taken on uh, since the beginning of the year. And then for the project overview, each country developed a concept note. They did a project plan, a budget, and an implementation team. The concept note and the budget were signed off, and the team was appointed in different roles. That is, uh, we have the country coordinator, the admin assistant, and the field monitors who do the, uh, the site support uh, uh, assessments. And then the teams had to undergo training on M&E and the electronic tool up and the refresher on hand hygiene. The mentoring was being done from the ICANN site and also by the coordinators to the field monitors on a weekly basis. The Zoom platform and uh, was used and each country had a license to use this as for uh, training and the virtual platform. 
And uh, this is how the, the organogram stands like in the project where we have um, the ICANN uh, executive manager and the chair uh, being uh, the overall leaders of the project. And then uh, on the bottom there, we've got the field monitors and the admin assistant that report to the country coordinator. And then the country coordinators in report, uh, in turn, they report to the training mm -hmm. manager, the project manager, the data manager, or the procurement and logistics manager who will further on then report to the ICANN admin. The ICANN and the country team roles, the teams were assigned uh, certain countries to take under wing during the project mm -hmm. and uh, their duties included the mentoring, the training, the delivery on the M&E, the challenges and the achievements, and then there are weekly meetings that are uh, acted as technical support and also use of the WhatsApp group were identified from the various countries and, the ro and their roles and responsibilities were set out and communicated to each other. They then had uh, defined deliverables and um, then uh, they would enlist other team members when support was needed, for example, uh, with hand hygiene. And then the countries hold weekly meetings as a team with a follow-up meeting with ICANN teams once a week. And then there are the meetings that are, that are held regularly on the virtual platform, with the, which includes uh, the ICANN team, the funders, and the country team. And they look at the data that has been collected on visits. And then this is the tool that uh, was developed and uh, the countries were trained on, and then it was rolled out for data collection and then they would uh, submit it electronically and it had uh, the GPS coordinates. And then the further on, the countries were trained via the Zoom platform. And then this is how the, uh, the, the week progresses in terms of uh, reporting, whereby uh, from Monday to Friday, we have uh, the various meetings with the different countries and also including uh, the sessions. And then on Friday, it becomes, uh, on Wednesday, we have the webinars uh, that we're currently having. And on Friday, it is uh, the French side webinar and also the meeting with uh, the other partners. And then the reporting on the data from each fa uh, facility, the monitors would go for the bi-weekly visits uh, to each allocated primary healthcare facility. And then they would do a uh, uh, feedback. And then they also identify uh, the, the gaps and the problem areas. Then the Resolve to Save Life uh, project leads as part of the weekly meetings would then convene the meeting and hold discussions on uh, the way forward and getting to identify uh, recommendations. The ICANN team, due to the COVID-19 restriction, uh, only managed to visit five out of the six countries at the end of the first phase of the project. And those countries were visited in January of 2021. And these were Ethiopia, Cameroon, Kenya, Nigeria, and DRC. And uh, we used the uh, red, amber, and green status for reporting so that we can track uh, progress over time in uh, discussed by Faith and Dr. Gudiza. And then um, you, we then collate the data into the tape and pie charts so that it's for ease ending. And then uh, it's being over. We are now moving on to which is part of the, the second phase in the color coded checklist to identify the gaps and improvements. And the funds have been identified for certain uh, small improvements and supply provisions, standard operating procedures that have been developed and implemented. Countries have uh, derived some action plans and they've held country stakeholder feedback uh, which proved to be of this project because uh, if you are just collecting data only and managers so that they can it can help improve policy or decision making then we'll be having problems and then we had uh, Ethiopia and Cameroon feedback on what has been uh, countries thank you and over I will give this time to uh, Dr. Wande to start on the questions and answer segment. 
Um, thank you very much, um, Lizzie, and to all of the speakers um, for a, a really nice um, um, presentation. We have quite a number of questions already on the Q&A function. Um, so colleagues, um, please feel free to um, put your questions on the question and answer um, function. Unfortunately, we will not be able to capture most of the questions on the chat box. And we have a, a good um, amount of time for the questions. Um, so feel free if there are other questions that um, uh, maybe you're experiencing or, um, in terms of challenges, we have a very diverse range of expertise on our panel session today. We have representatives um, from the countries. Um, we will be sharing their experience. We have our, our partner organizations, um, which include ICANN, USCDC, Resolve to Save Lives, and um, I believe a colleague from um, WHO. So on that note, I think I will start with some of the questions. Um, I see some of the questions are around um, things like the community of practice. Um, please, the link for the community of practice will be on the chat box. Um, please um, join the community of practice and we can follow up with the slides and the recordings of the session. All the PowerPoint slides will to the email that you used to register for this session. Um, it will be sent to you in a few days. The question um, is around um, the, the second presentation. Um, it's like the, um, we need to know if you what the percentage of healthcare workers. Uh, I, I believe the person is trying to say that they would like to know um, the percentage of the healthcare workers who are being trained in your country. So I think it might be useful to hear from Ethiopia uh, and Cameroon to know what the percentage of healthcare worker. Um, are receiving the training. Faith or um, um, our colleagues from um, Ethiopia. Dr. Alimayu, okay. I see you, um, you, you can unmute yourself. Okay, uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. As it is the afternoon here in Ethiopia. <clears throat> well, uh, to, to, to say, I don't have the exact figures for Ethiopia, uh, but uh, we have a series of trainings given to health professionals. Um, and if you, it, it varies from region, sorry, it varies from region to region. Uh, if you come to add this, almost uh, nearly all as professionals working in um, health facilities have been given the training. And as Dr. Gudisa told you earlier, also uh, support staff from health fa facilities, although not all, but most of them have been trained. Uh, if uh, you ask me to, to estimate what percentage, I would say about 80% of the health professionals have been trained. Uh, that have, um, and all health pro uh, professionals that work in uh, treatment centers have taken treatment and um, uh, quarantine centers have been uh, taken the training. That's what I can say. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that um, um, very useful insight. I think it's quite impressive to see how well um, our focus is on healthcare workers. Um, again, that's why we have this um, very strong partnership to ensure that we are able to reach as many healthcare workers and facility managers to strengthen their knowledge on IPC. Um, so Fitz, there's a direct question to you. It's around... Um, waste management and the follow-up around waste management, and also questions around challenges to reach remote facilities. Um, um, so the question just wants to look around, um, does, is, is waste management part of the follow-up? What are your indicators and how do you um, deal with the challenges to reach remote facilities? Over to you, Faith. Thank you. Yes, waste management is part of it. And we have been going to, they have been educating the, 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 the facilities on, on proper waste management. And there we have been seeing for some, they were not having the, the, the beans. And with the continuous education we have been giving them, 
uh, they may not have the color coded bags, but then some have the, the just the plastics and they have it lined, they lined their waist, their beans with them. And from there, they are able to, when they, when they have their, their waste in it, they now carry it to their waste bins where it is properly discarded. Thank you, over. Uh, thank you, fantastic. So um, I think this question I will throw to Lizzie, um, just because I know that she has done quite a number of work around hand washing um, and behavior change, and also to Prof, if you'd like to join in. Um, um, uh, the question uh, is really Dr. on- Dr. Wande, please. Can I make a statement about training for Cameroon? Um, yes, yeah, sure, Mr. Um, okay. Please go ahead. Thank you. I'm Jacob from Cameroon, uh, one of the national uh, coordinators. Uh, concerning training, our training was tailored to address gaps that were identified in the field. Uh, some of the uh, training were just given on the spot to address specific issues. For example, uh, teaching the housekeepers how to prepare 0.5% uh, chlorine or how to clean and so on and so forth. And then uh, the other trainings that we kept track of were online trainings. Uh, between um, September and December, we had um, 14 sessions uh, with about 260 attendees. Uh, attendance was ranging from 11 to 27 per day. And uh, this is quite low because uh, not many people are able to use the online platforms. And uh, so we are beginning to engage them and we believe that in subsequent times, I am sure when they become used to the online platforms, uh, more people will be able to attend. Uh, in terms of percentage, it's difficult to quantify now, but uh, just from exhumation, I think the, the percentage will still be quite low uh, but if we add the on-the-spot on training and online training, then uh, we can conveniently say that we have reached at least a good number of, uh, of the healthcare workers with um, information about gaps regarding uh, COVID-19 prevention. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Jacob, for that. So back to my question um, um, to Lizzie. It's... Um, the question is around the fact that um, although most healthcare facilities have um, and washing facilities in place, most of them are not used properly. Um, they are only displayed there um, just uh, to, as, as, as a means to check off um, something off the... How can we um, change the behavior towards and washing um, among healthcare workers and as well as patients? So over to you, Lizzie. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Wande, uh, for that question. So in terms of uh, hand hygiene, in as much as it is very critical, there are a lot of behavior change issues that uh, need to be addressed. I will talk about uh, what we have done in the project so that we try and uh, get to change the attitudes of uh, healthcare workers in terms of hand hygiene. We have uh, rolled out uh, hand hygiene trainings in all the countries that are being uh, supported by the project. We first do the initial uh, two hours. Uh, these trainings were now being done virtually, whereby uh, we introduce the hand transmission uh, uh, mechanisms of how to transmit pathogens. And then uh, we also introduced the concept of the patient zone and the healthcare area, a concept which uh, seems to be mostly not understood by healthcare workers. And then uh, we also introduced them to the, the WHO five moments of a hand hygiene concept, whereby we define each moment and we give uh, examples. And then thereafter, we show some uh, videos of uh, the day-to-day -day hospital to show how diseases or transmissions uh, take place and uh, with the hope that uh, that will actually provoke them to change their behaviors. And then later on, what we do is we continue. We schedule some times where we do follow up, maybe for an hour or for uh, uh, two hours, where we play out scenarios and the healthcare workers will then um, say out which uh, 
hand hygiene opportunities they have identified and whether the actions have been missed or not. And then for Cameroon, uh, because their training was held uh, just because before there was uh, the global lockdown, we make uh, use of other training materials in the example of um, the, the check light or glow gel, whereby uh, we first contaminate the healthcare workers' hands with uh, some lotion, which mimics viruses, and we allow them to do their day-to-day -day things in the ward. And then after some time, we then call them and we then pass a UV light in uh, their hands just to show the amount of contamination that they have. So that has pr proved to be one of uh, uh, a, a, a big big game changers in terms of uh, changing the behavior for uh, healthcare workers. And so what the project has done is um, uh, the ICANN office has managed to procure these uh, uh, pocket um, uh, uh, instruments and they have sent to the countries that are in the project so that they can roll out the hand hygiene trainings and also use those machines as part of our behavior change strategies. Thank you and over. Thank you very much, Lizzie. Um, I think our, our colleagues have really found the presentations from um, Ethiopia and Cameroon quite interesting. We have a question from Burkina Faso um, around the challenges experience, which one of them um, from their part is the road difficulty. I think um, our colleague wants to learn from um, representatives from um, Ethiopia and Cameroon, what other challenges um, they experienced um, in implementing this project. Then we'll move to um, the um, um, questions, more questions in a few minutes. Over to you, uh, Faith and um I'm Faith and Dr. Gudisa, if you're happy to answer the questions around the challenges um, um, for getting to other um, facilities. Okay, uh, thank you. This is Gudisa. One day. So I have already mentioned most of the problems I actually faced here from Ethiopia, but and I'm just from the, the capital, Addis Ababa. And then actually all of the health centers are located here in the, in the, in the town. But most of our uh, monitors are from uh, different regions. So they have still a difficulty of uh, accessing the facilities with the road and also uh, resources associated with that. And then there are also some uh, internet challenges, but the I can resolve uh, still planning to solve that problems. Otherwise, uh, most of the problems or the challenges are which, uh, which, which are here around us and we are trying to solve by ourselves. Thank you, Yohan, over to you. Thanks. Um, Fit, do you, do you want to add yeah. on to that? Yes, the main difficulty was the, the roads. And the, the other thing too is just that the, the transport system, things you could not have your own uh, personal, which I mean, a transport, a vehicle that could carry you to the place. Then you have to spend long waiting time at the bus stop. And so the main challenge revolves around well, movement, I mean, the challenge with difficulty actually getting to the place. Since you were not using your own bed, you have to use public transportation. Thank you. Dr. Wande, may I just add uh, another peculiar thing to us that um, August, September is a very uh, heavy rainy period in Cameroon. So in some of the places, if it rains heavily, water will overflow and a river that you may cross on foot, sometimes you might not be able to cross even on a vehicle. And so when it happens, it means that the monitor has to stay the other side until the river uh, goes down before uh, they are able to cross. And then because of the rain too, some of the routes became very bad between August, uh, September and October. And so a trip that may be used to take one or two days, you might take three uh, or four days. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, um, Jacob, for that. I think um, 
we will move to some other questions um, and, and definitely come back to questions around um, um, the M&E project that is being conducted. It looks like we have quite a number of questions on that. Um, so um, yes, I think we'll definitely come back to that. Um, so Professor Shade, um, there are quite a number of questions around enrolling into like, um, I think this is based off um, um, Lise's presentation, um, but um, enrolling into the continental icon body or to national bodies. Um, I believe that um, I've seen quite a number of questions popping up around that. If you'd like to talk a bit about that. And also um, um, Lizzie, if you can talk a bit about the countries that have been selected for this project and if there are any plans um, for expansion um, in collaboration with Resolve to Save Life. Over to you, Prof. Shade, and next, Lizzie. Thank you very much. Um, yes, um, we welcome all to join ICANN. And um, we have a, 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 a portal.co.za, which um, uh, Lizzie uh, can please put on the chat box so, um, so that people can see this. You go to that website, then you can enroll your details and you make a payment. Now, um, in terms of cost, um, if you're coming in as a single person, not affiliated to any society, then you're, you'll be paying like $25. Uh, $25. Um, but if you are affiliated, if you're a society affiliated to ICANN, then you'll only pay $5. I can really would love everybody to be in some society or the other for the main reason that IPC can be quite lonely. Um, we're still trying to make sure IPC is recognized on the ground and we recognize that people need support so that you can, one, motivate yourselves. Um, you have a block that can act as an advocacy group in your country. And so we need to push IPC across the whole country. So we encourage people to come together and set up um, societies that will assist the growth of IPC. Um, we support you to do this. So if you're interested in that, you can, you can send us a message. Um, we can put our um, to, the, um, to the executive manager, who is our administrative, um, who heads the administrative office. And that's, um, and but you can also get in touch with me or any of us, and we can put our, um, our emails for you on the, um, in, the, in the chat so that you can join. And we have um, um, also resources for um, societies to help them to set up, and we will hold your hands to do so. So um, I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Prof. Um, so it sounds like um, there was a bit of a network. Um, so oh. I will, yes, if possible, if Lizzie um, or anyone from ICANN can put the email address or the website um, where participants can reach out to everyone um, and then yeah. we can take that forward. Um, so Lizzie, uh, countries that were selected and if this project is going to be expanded. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Wande, uh, for that question. I will have part A of uh, the question, and I would also like uh, for part B to be uh, answered by uh, my colleagues from the different countries that are going to continue the program so that they will be with uh, everyone listening in on how uh, we will be moving forward. Uh, to start with, uh, the program is uh, proceeding to a second phase, but uh, with um, four out of uh, the six countries. And then uh, what is going to happen is uh, we are looking also at uh, exploring uh, sustainability issues. And uh, as I earlier on alluded to on the presentation that uh, we signed an uh, MO MOU so that we try and get uh, the involvement from uh, the facility managers and from uh, the governments. And uh, from what uh, Dr. Gudisa and uh, Faith shared 
what uh, ended up happening after the first phase of the project is that uh, there was the stakeholders uh, meeting. That is when they were feedbacking to the facility and uh, uh, managers and also the um, uh, members from the or representatives from the ministry so that we could get a buy-in and also look at the sustainability issues. That is how we uh, uh, envisage to move forward. And then in addition to that, we will continue uh, supporting the primary health care centers because uh, the reason why we looked at them is that uh, most of the time so much emphasis is put on the provincial county or tertiary hospitals while neglecting the first uh, levels of care. And as we have seen uh, from the presentations that there has been some challenges and also what is good is that the fact that uh, at the end of the first phase, we, came, uh, we ended up with healthcare workers who were more informed and were able to use uh, resources effectively. So at this time, I would uh, hand over to Ms. Uh, uh, Aleta Masha from uh, Zimbabwe uh, to give us some advice on how we can uh, put uh, or engage facility uh, managers who are not part of such programs uh, in uh, finding ways to implement such similar things in facilities. Thank you and over. Uh, thank you, Lizzie. Um, I would like to share that from experience, the resolve to save lives model uh, can be replicated uh, anywhere in the sense that uh, we know that COVID is here to stay. Uh, we will have other outbreaks, even if uh, COVID goes away, we will have other outbreaks. So uh, institutions need to be prepared for any outbreak and um, to be to have structures that um, can respond to uh, any outbreak. If for example, they need to have a solid infection prevention and control program, and uh, at least uh, train staff on standard precautions and precaution-based precautions. So if you have a functional IPC program, uh, issues to do with any outbreak can be dis discussed. So I would urge managers to, to put in place functional IPC program. The other issue is to invest in technology uh, in terms of Zoom, WhatsApp groups where primary care centers and other people can share information and to put in place a mentorship program that goes on site to people rather than call them for a, a meet a workshop at a hotel and you can't reach everyone. But if you go on site and do a hands-on skills develop, doing well, um, give incentives in terms of maybe um, best performing institution in a county or in a region, they get a sense of pride to share with other people. So it is a doable model and you need to pick minimum indicators that people can, can track and then move on to higher indicators. Thank you and over. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that very um, um, useful insight. I think we have a, a few questions for Africa CDC, and I will be happy to take some of them. Um, I think one of the questions um, was really around our epidemiologic update. And um, the question is um, why the first slide um, was separating countries across the continent, including South Africa. So ideally, we what we try to do is because right now, um, um, based on the number of cases, um, South Africa has the highest um, number of cases. So what we try to do is give like a separation to see what is going on in South Africa and also what is going on across other countries um, on the continent. Um, but you would notice that the, um, the following um, slides um, were able to put the numbers together as a continent. So I think um, um, the speaker was just really trying to show you what is happening across the continent and seeing what our seven day moving average is like. Um, that's to answer that question. Um, the, the, this other question is around um, 
developing a, 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 a legal framework um, where we encourage member states to create specific programs for IPC. Um, yes, um, um, Dr. Yusuf, you may be aware that um, we have uh, finalized that fr um, legal framework and many of our colleagues um, who are on this call today were part of the validation process or the inputs um, give, give their feedback through their member states and their foreign um, affairs embassy. Um, so we are moving this document to the next phase which is to the ministerial level um, from so, for some sort of endorsement by the ministers of health. So Africa Union has really prioritized um, ensuring that member states can set up um, specific programs around infection prevention and control. Uh, and lastly, there's a question around distribution of, um, uh, of um, face masks to Africans. Um, so what we have tried to do um, since the onset of this outbreak is ensuring that all of our 55 member states have access um, um, through um, philanthropic um, donation through the Africa Union um, COVID um, um, fund. We have tried to deploy as much um, 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 PPE, including face masks to African countries, um, which um, from the member states is being distributed to healthcare facilities, health workers, and the people who need it the most. So um, we have done that, and we have also created um, a procurement platform um, for, for, for the member states um, so that um, they can easily just go on the website and click and buy. Um, so ideally, it will be from member states, so um, an individual cannot go on that site to buy, but it's at, the, um, at, at a good cost for member states, so member states can do um, buy purchasing for their PPE. Um, um, so that's the question around what we are doing regarding um, uh, the distribution and the procurement of um, PPE across the continent. Um, Lizzie, I know that you have certain questions that you had prepared for the um, panel. Um, if you want to take a go at um, a few questions, then we will go back um, um, to answer um, additional questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Wande. Uh, my next question is uh, directed to uh, Dr. Eugene from uh, Nigeria. I wanted to find out from you, uh, how long do you get to remain in the facilities when you arrive and what gets to happen when you notice a gap during that time? Thank you and over to you, Dr. Eugene. Thank you for inviting me. This is Dr. Eugene from Abuja, Nigeria. Uh, on arrival at each facility, arrival at each facility, uh, first of all, usually I used to go with my own vehicle. Most of the facilities were either suburban or in the urban area. So it was not too far away from, uh, from me. When I get to the facility, what I'll do is just wait a while in the car to set uh, my instruments. And in the process, I watch the triage and uh, see how many people go in with or without a mask or with uh, washing their hands or not before I move in, I move into the facility. It takes about no less than two hours because most times it's observation and I have to wait for the health workers to finish their duties. And then I'll get to see the officer in charge of the OIC and we'll look at the gaps that I've uh, identified. we we'll discuss them. In such cases, we invite if there's any special officer in charge or involved in the issue that we identified, we'll sit down one-on-one -on -one and discuss such issues. Most of the issues were usually uh, behavior change issues, and uh, it took one-on-one -on -one, uh, discussion to, to mentor the health worker and let him or her appreciate the need for whatever is being requested. And in such cases, we've done very well. They have had to change their behavior, and um, it's been a very wonderful experience. Thank you, and over. Thank you, uh, Dr. Eugene. And then my uh, next questions, uh, the first one is directed to Faith. Do you inform the facilities in advance uh, for the visit? And then to Dr. Gudiza, do you uh, give feedback on the same day? Thank you. Thank you, 
Yes, I do inform them that I will be coming. Most of the facilities, uh, having uh, um, really just a, a single staff because they're in the remote areas. So you need to inform so that you are, you are sure that you have that staff on the facility the day you, you arrive to be able to do the work you have to do. Thank you. Thank you, and over to Dr. Kudisa. Thank you. Uh, that's a nice question that whether I give feedback on the same day or the day after it. Yes, actually, uh, I give uh, the feedback immediately after uh, I'm done with the supervision because before uh, I travel to the facility, we, as uh, my colleague has mentioned, that we inform the key member of the committee uh, especially that the focal person and, and, and the department hates uh, like that we have uh, the, mon the monitoring program on that day. So once I finish, because I have said that the monitoring has two parts, we may uh, uh, fill the data online and the other is we have also the uh, hard core process uh, on my hand. So they will have their own and then I have my own and then we will summarize it at the, at the, the, the end of the uh, supervision so that we will identify the main gaps so that the, they, they uh, have an action plan on it. So on the next uh, site visit, we will start uh, from that, whether they, uh, they are solved or not, or is still uh, whether it is still remaining. So th thank you. Over to you, Doctor. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kudisa, for that. And I uh, will hand over to uh, Dr. Wande to continue with the Q&A. Thank you and over. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's been quite interactive. We have quite a number of questions coming uh, and we are trying to ensure that we streamline based on the co current conversation and other things that... Um, um, that we that we uh, uh, um, we have the opportunity to um, discuss. Um, so I think um, Elizabeth, if you are still on the call, uh, our colleague from um, um, USCDC, if you would like to um, 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 just talk a bit about, um, I think one of the things that we have been saying since we started this. Uh, this um, um, series of, um, um, of training is around beyond the trainings, how do we drive behavior change? So, uh, and this is something that I know that varies across um, countries to countries and across various continents, but I think it's still the same um, sort of um, um, principle for healthcare workers. How are we able to drive um, behavior change around um, um, proper use of PPE, things like and hygiene, and how we can actually get them to change their behavior. Um, so if you'd like to share, um, based on some of the your, um, things that you have, you have learned um, uh, um, on your work, it would be helpful to us. Sure, thanks, Wande. Really uh, appreciate the question and appreciate being here. Uh, behavior change is tricky. Um, uh, we all know of it probably from our personal lives where every year around the new year, we make a res uh, resolution to change some kind of behavior uh, within ourselves whether it be diet, exercise, uh, being kinder to other people, reading more, getting a better work-life balance, whatever it is. And I think we often find ourselves by the end of the year or even one or two months later, um, kind of coming up short in what our resolution is for our own personal behavior change. So we understand that it is very, very hard to do behavior change. But I think there are a couple of key components um, that will assist in making uh, behavior change. Uh, one of which is provide having people understand what the risks are if they do not change their behavior. Um, in particular, personal risk to themselves um, is often a, a great motivator, as well as risk to patients or to others who are close to them or, or people who are meaningful to them. Often that means uh, people are motivated to get into a healthier lifestyle um, because they want to be around for their children or grandchildren. Um, in the healthcare worker setting, we would want people to be motivated to do behavior change, better use of PPE and hand washing, if not for themselves, to really understand the role it has in protecting patients. We also want to set um, 
we want to set for uh, the use, correct use of PPE or for hand washing, really to set it as a professional norm, you know, so that it's not, it's not something that's seen as layered on as extra that you need to do for a patient or to provide good health care, that it's seen as a professional expectation that this is what you do in the same way that you um, get, uh, write notes after you see a patient, for example, um, taking down their vital signs. That, that you know, that's a professional expectation of an interaction between a healthcare worker and a patient in the same way that using PPE correctly, washing hands should also be seen as that same baseline professional expectation that you do for patients. We need as much as possible, and I think this was touched upon earlier um, by the fellow who spoke from Ethiopia, if not Cameroon, I apologize if I'm uh, mixing them up, um, about really getting that administrative level support so that all the way up to the, uh, what we call the C-suite, the corporate suite, the administrative level, that they are really supporting the behavior change amongst uh, their healthcare workers and that they see it as an important uh, measure and as an important part of, of daily healthcare. And then, um, and then to really get back to touching upon uh, a lot of what this uh, webinar has been about, which is the kind of M&E, the monitoring, the constant monitoring, the constant feedback um, that goes to the healthcare workers, that goes to the administration, and also the key mentorship uh, to be able to keep advocating, cheering on behavior change, celebrating successes, but also when there's, um, when there's not a good success and there's not good compliance, problem solving with people on the front line about how to change things um, would be the best. Over back to you, Wande. Um, thank you very much um, um, for that input. Um, um, Karin, I know that um, your group has really done um, a lot of support with ICANN um, um, looking at this M&E um, um, &E project across um, our various member states. So if you would like to just um, talk a bit about um, sort of um, the, the key lessons um, to learn and how we can start to advocate for this across um, um, several other member states. Over to you, Karin. Thank you, Wande. Um, I think I want to thank Dr. Gudisa and Faith for the fabulous presentations and all the incredible work that they did um, over these last six, seven months. Um, obviously, Resolve is very committed to this project and to its continuation. Uh, I think that ICANN's checklist monitoring form has been a superb tool to use. And I saw in the chat box, there were questions about it being available and I, it's up to ICANN, but I would certainly advocate uh, sharing this tool. Um, I think that, you know, as Elizabeth said, constant monitoring is, is tremendously important and supportive site visits. Supportive site visits means you go to the facility to help the healthcare workers protect themselves and patients. You don't go there as policemen. And that's a concept that this team, um, which ICANN has led, uh, I think really now understands. And I would hope uh, this will continue and expand um, because I believe that this is the only way to impact uh, infection control behavior. Um, I don't know what other details I can suggest, but, but, but I'm, I'm really quite impressed by how well this project has gone and it has not been easy as you probably gather from the presentations. Fantastic, thank you so much um, to all of um, the speakers um, that joined us today's session. Um, thank you for your um, time. Um, um, Today's session is session that um, and start several certificates. Um, certificates are available um, based on patient. And this is a participate in the email. I believe. That being crunched, um, being for. Um,
uh, um, engaging. And on that note, on behalf of Africa CDC, um, I would really like to thank our partners for this um, particular series. Um, I'd like to thank uh, our partners from ICANN, um, from WHO Afro and Resolve to Save Lives. And most, most importantly, I'd like to thank our um, country representatives um, for taking the time out of their very um, intense, <laughs> crazy busy um, schedules to share your experience. Because the idea of this is that we share our best practices, we learn from each other's challenges to ensure that we have a safer Africa. Um, so thank you very much to my colleagues that have um, um, participated on the various webinars series from various countries. I'd like to thank you very much um, to the team that has worked um, um, on the back end of setting this whole platform up um, from Africa CDC and ICANN. I'd like to say thank you very much. Um, but most importantly, um, to all of our participants who have consistently joined um, this um, um, session, we hope that we were able to um, address some of your needs. Um, feel free to send us an email um, or, or just go on our website or, or, or reply the email that sends you the slides. Um, if you have any particular topics you like us weeks, um, please um, send, the, send them to us. If you're experiencing particular challenges within your healthcare facility or within your countries, um, that is why we are here. We're here to address all of your needs. And so please send us your questions, your proposed topics, and we'll definitely consider them. So on that note, I say thank you very much and have a lovely afternoon, morning, or evening, depending on where you're ca calling in from. We will see you... Um, um, next upper week, actually, because we're taking a one week break. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you and bye. Thank you.